Hello, everybody tuning in. This is Josh Alexander, and I'd like to introduce Mina and David. They're going to help us talk about what's going on in the housing market right now. Um, I'm just going to start going over a little bit of what the actual stats are, and then we're going to follow that up with Mina talking about some of what's going on in the lending part of the world. And then David's going to cover what's going on in the title side of things and how things are starting to change because of everything going on with uh, COVID-19. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so over the last week, there's been a significant amount of change in the housing market. So as you probably know, 80% of the nation is pretty much on lockdown now. And because of that, supply really is, uh, and demand is really starting to go down. So over the last week and a half, supply has actually stayed about the same. Um, which doesn't seem that bad, but this time of year, usually supply is going up by six to eight percent every few weeks. Um, and so supply is basically flatlined at this point. So every house that's sold, there's still another one coming on the market, but in general, uh, supply is flatlined. Now, the biggest indicator of what's going on with the uh, COVID 19 is the demand side. So over the last week, demand has fallen by 14 percent. Um, and that is largely due to all the restrictions in place where you can no longer have open houses. Many showings are not being done anymore because of the restrictions as well. So because demand has been falling, we're looking basically at the days on market, which is the time a home is placed on the market, to the time it goes into escrow is starting to skyrocket. So two weeks ago, days on market was under 50 days. Today, or as of yesterday, actually, days on market has gone up to 72 days. So what does that mean for buyers and sellers? It basically means that we've been going from a seller, a hot seller's market, and now we're transitioning in just to a slight seller's market. So it looks like it's going to be remaining in that trajectory until we get this under control. So I anticipate over the next few weeks, we're probably gonna see us go closer and closer into a balanced market, because even though there's a lot of homes on the market, uh, there's going to be less and less buyers looking at them. So that's going to transition us out of a seller's market where we started this year and slowly go into a balanced market. Um, another indicator of what's going on is a lot of those homes that have been for sale that have not really had success have put them on hold or have canceled them altogether. So just another kind of uh, stat for you guys to look at is last month, the average amount of homes that have been placed on hold or canceled in Orange County, you were looking at right around 285. This last, uh, that's in February, sorry, since it's April 1st now, for March, um, that jumped. So 285 for February, in March we went up to 1,136 homes have been canceled or put on hold. So buyer, buyers right now really just don't have that many homes to choose from. Um, and that's kind of what's driving the market right now. Uh, so, with that, that's just kind of a basic update. And like I said, what's basically happening right now, the housing market, we're still, we're still going. We're now classified as essential as of last Saturday. So they're still able to do a lot of things like showings, except a lot of them have to be virtual now. And we'll go over more in detail how the transactions look now in a little bit. But first I wanna kind of go over what the lending side of things looks like. Uh, and for that, I'll kind of let Mina go over that. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely a lot of, changes we're seeing in the on a daily basis even and so it's just kind of important and i like how josh right now is just focusing on data because data we can always rely on and with all the uncertainties i think we just need to focus on the data and see exactly where it's going but i guess um to summarize in terms of the rates the loan programs and kind of my recommendations and where to kind of just keep an eye out for at the moment if you are a client looking to buy a home or if you're a realtor with a client in escrow potentially, just please uh, keep an eye out and be in communication with whatever mortgage professional or company you're working with because a lot of the program guide guidelines are changing on a daily basis. And the reason why is just because of, like I talked about the uncertainty factor, because you know, last week the unemployment report came out for the first time since everything started really escalating and 3.3 million unemployed people and what, that's going, how that's going to impact the guidelines and the different programs available is because all these different mortgage companies need to take into consideration the risk factor of the market we're in right now. And so with the COVID-19, I mean, it definitely is kind of a black sheep moment that nobody could have predicted, but because of the fact that, you know, 
there's a lot of uncertainties with job security too, with a lot of different consumers. Some program guidelines are tightening. And so maybe a few weeks ago, the guidelines were X, Y, and Z, but then now they might be a little bit different. And certain parts of the escrow process might feel and be a little bit delayed because again, yeah, simply we can't leave our homes right now or you know, we can to buy things, but everybody's at home right now, which means that appraisers might not want to go out to properties or notaries might not want to meet with a client. So all these different aspects are being a little bit impacted. And so I guess um, tip-wise, a few different changes that we've seen with Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie are now kind of being more aware of all these different kind of constrictions that we're seeing with the appraiser, for example. So they're loosening up the guidelines for the appraisal. And they released a new form where basically they don't have to go inside the property to give you a value. And for those of you refinancing, there's something called an appraisal waiver. And they've actually loosened up the qualifications to you know, actually get that waiver, which means you don't need an appraisal at all. And so I would, if you got that ran, something called a desktop underwriter, if you talked to a lender a week ago, have them rerun it and see what the new, I guess, system will tell you regarding the appraisal, like what the requirements would be. And then lastly, um, I don't want to, yeah, there's a lot of different updates to go over, but just so I'm not going and rambling too much on the interest rates. So the rates have been and experiencing the most volatility that the mortgage industry has ever seen. And we have to kind of come to that understanding that we aren't in a normal market. A lot of the things happening we've never seen before. And stocks are up 2,000 points, down 1,500 points, up again. It's crazy increased volatility that we're just not used to in this environment. But the reason why the interest rates stopped kind of following the trends that they typically did where uh, for those of you who don't know, typically what the mortgage companies and the mortgage lenders would do is we'll look at the 10 year treasuries. If they go down, the rates would loosely follow that too. But that behavior changed a couple of weeks ago when everything started escalating. And so with the rates, what I'm just letting everyone know of right now is number one, the rate can be something in the morning and completely different in the afternoon. And I think everyone needs to understand that rates have always changed every day, but in this kind of market climate, they're literally fluctuating up and down. And so the importance of one, just keeping in communication, kind of like every other aspect, but two, um, making sure too that whoever you're working with or what realtor or lender, whatever real estate professionals you're working with are aware of all these different changes and why they're happening. Because I think without that understanding, um, people are feeling like we were, you know, kind of told one thing and it ends up being completely different. And it's out of a lot of people's control, but one thing we can control is just setting the expectation and letting everyone know this is how it works and why everything's changing and why um, it's important to kind of keep an eye on, you know, I guess when to lock and things like that. But uh, last thing I will note though, I mean, when the market stabilizes, the rate behaviors will go back to normal and every indication is pointing to rates coming down. And so I know that who knows when exactly um, the pandemic will be contained, but I remind everybody that the opportunities, the home you buy, things like that you can control and the interest rates, wherever they are during the escrow period, maybe they might be that way right now, but six months down the line when everything hopefully again will go back to normal, the rates are going to come down. You could always, you know, refinance into that lower rate at that point. So your maybe higher payment at that point in time is not going to be for the longer and it will be for the shorter run. So just be in constant communication, be aware of these kind of changes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, with the lend with lenders too, especially what I'm seeing um, as an agent, it's extremely important to make sure almost daily at this point that you're touching base yeah. with your lender because things are changing so rapidly, especially with these loan programs where people qualified for them a week ago, but now they no longer qualify them. So it's something that yeah. they need to make sure that if you are looking to purchase a home right now, that it's not just, oh, I'll talk to my lender once every two weeks. It's you pretty much need to be in daily communication to make sure nothing has significantly changed on that end. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy with everything changing, but <laughs> The whole reason why at the end of the day is, again, the volatility and the uncertainty, because a lot of these investors who offer these programs, they're not wanting to, or they don't feel secure enough to keep lending on this kind of environment right now. And that's why we're constantly seeing changes. Yep, perfect. Um, okay, so David, title insurance. A lot of people don't know what that is for one, or <laughs> what it has to do with the real estate transaction. Um, so if you wanna to talk to them a little bit about that, and then, also, uh, we're just kind of trying to figure out what 
on your end would cause a transaction not to close or be held up because of these new regulations that are being put in and all the new um, quarantine effects, things like that. So can you kind of go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our, my tagline is title is boring and, and it, it's really <laughs> one of those things. And, and I was taught when I entered the industry in 2001, that, that if we've done our job right, nobody knows that we've actually done anything at all. Um, so we, I, I actually work for Fidelity National Title. We're the largest title insurance company in the world. And uh, we are an insurance company. I, I'm, not, I'm not licensed by the Department of Real Estate. My license is actually with the Department of Insurance. And title insurance is an insurance policy that's issued uh, at the point of sale or the refinance of real property that ensures that there aren't any encumbrances or problems with that property. It protects everybody. So um, if escrow is the quarterback, we're the referee. And, and so what we do is we make sure we, we do a lot of researching, a lot of things done on the back end. And then when the property is closed or recorded, as we call it, we actually then issue uh, what's called clear title and a title insurance policy. It's a one-time policy. It carries uh, through the life of the house uh, with that current owner. And it goes, it literally goes from one person to the next transaction to the next transaction. And so it's a, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, man, if, if hopefully you'll never need it, but when you do, you'll be glad you have it. It is the cheapest and probably most insur uh, most important insurance policy you'll own. A, a lot of folks will say, you know, it's just a, it's just a fee. Well, you know, I mean, if we have cars, we have car insurance too. Um, your house has a lot more, is a lot more valuable for most people than their car. And there's a lot more liability with owning a home uh, than owning a car. And, and that's why that's why you have title insurance. Um, so what we do uh, throughout the process, if, if you're doing a refinance or purchasing a property, we, we close the transaction. We're actually the ones that take the original documents and record them with the county recorders. Now, as it stands right now, and I'm only comfortable in saying this on April 1st, 2020 <laughs> at 1.23 p.m. Pacific time because stuff is changing so rapidly. Um, as it stands right now, there's normally one or two documents that get recorded at the close of transaction. One is called the grant deed, okay? A grant deed is also referred to the vesting. It's how the property is owned, whether it's owned in a trust, um, tenants in common, joint tenants, and individual corporation, that is secured by what's called the grant deed. The other document, um, the one that Mina works on, is called the deed of trust. The deed of trust is the instrument that secures the mortgage or the loan. So if you buy a property in cash, uh, Josh, here, here, I'm putting you on the spot. If you buy a property in cash, how many deeds of trust are recorded? How many deeds of trust? One. Zero. Zero. Well, there Zero. There is no, <laughs> yeah. There is, there are no... There are no deeds of trust when a property is purchased in cash, okay? Um, so those two documents, the deed of trust and the grant deed, are originals right now. They're, they're notarized, they're wet ink signature, and as it stands right now, at now 1.24 p.m., they have to be original notarized documents. We don't accept copies, we don't accept scans. So what happens is uh, our process is, you know, Escrow gets the, the documents, all the packet together, whether it's a purchase or a refinance, and they send us the documents. And as soon as we have the clear to close, um, as soon as we get the clear to close from escrow and funds have been received, for the most part, we use a process called e-recording or electronic recording. That is our normal process, okay? Nothing has changed with COVID-19. That has not changed. That's how we do it here. Orange County, Los Angeles County, San Bernardino, San Diego, Ventura, Santa Barbara. If you're in Southern California, that's how it works. It how it, it's how it works in most counties is it's e-recorded. So what, and the reason, um, so once we scan that document, we're waiting for what we call confirmation of recording. Uh, the transfer or the refinance hasn't taken place or closed until we receive that confirmation of recording from the county. Uh, the new owner, or the new loan becomes of record the second that that document is recorded. So all these title companies are utilizing the same e-recording service. So think of like a line at, at a grocery store or something like that. Um, and they get recorded in the order in which they were received. 
Uh, and so as long as we can continue to e-record transactions, not a whole lot is changing from a title perspective. Um, like I said, Southern California is all good. If anybody's watching this outside of the state, um, most counties use e-recording. I have a, a nifty little document I can send you for all the counties in California. There's only a handful of folks that are doing paper recordings and it's not in any of the large population centers. Got it. And then for, that's one thing to note as well. So for something that needs to be notarized, that's one of the points of contact. There's not many right now in the transaction. Um, that's one of the points of contact that you do need to make to have everything go smoothly. So that's, that's one thing I wanna bring up. I'll talk about a little bit more in terms of you really only have a few points of contact through an entire transaction where you have to be face to face with someone and that notarization of the deed is one of them. Is there anything that you're finding an issue in terms of getting that notary out there and getting them to get it notarized? Um, I haven't seen any issues. I have a couple uh, folks uh, that I work with that are notaries. Um, I actually have one, one that I spoke with yesterday and you know, they're just, they're busy and they're being safe. They're, they're, they're following the precautions, wearing masks, wearing gloves, using pens once, um, you know, it, in, in trying to do that process as, as quickly as possible. Um, there's rumor about accepting, you know, virtual notaries and stuff right now. Uh, they're not doing it yet at 1.27 p.m. That could change. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I just, you know, the situation's so fluid with what we deal with, um, and, and it is unprecedented. So I, I just want to be sure that, you know, the information is current as we stand right now. Yeah, um, exactly. I'd like to add, too, I mean, as far as the notary goes as well, I think, yeah, just make sure that you're prepared for, you know, whatever... I guess signings might be coming up for everybody out there because maybe some notaries don't feel comfortable doing it. But then if you already have some people that you've spoken with who are taking all the precautions that's needed with disinfectants, you know, hand sanitizer, then, you know, you're better prepared for that closing. And so definitely I've come across a couple of times, like maybe one notary was not comfortable doing X, Y, and Z, but then fortunately, as long as you have some backups, plan B, plan C prepared, then, you know, you won't come across too much of a problem with the notary side of things. Yeah, and I'd say this, and, and this is the only thing that I'll say, is, is, is if you're exhibiting any kind of symptoms, um, and, and, you know, it is not worth, <laughs> it is just not worth risking that for, to get a, a document notarized. Yeah. I mean, I maybe Josh, Mina, maybe you disagree, but like, th this is a nasty, unprecedented thing, and safety, in my opinion, has to come first. Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And then I think um, that's the important thing for I think everybody in any profession, they have to kind of realize because I think every step of any process in the world right now is being impacted. And I think it's just coming to the understanding of we all need to, at the very most focus on the health of everybody in the world. I mean, literally, it's crazy, the entire world at the exact same time, <laughs> agreed upon the fact that the COVID-19 coronavirus is a huge deal. And so the impact it has on not just the U.S. economy, but the entire world's economy and at what everybody's going through is completely crazy. But yeah, I agree. I think it's just about kind of getting back to the roots of it and being appreciative of what we're at and, you know, not taking any unnecessary risk. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and that's something with buyers and sellers right now. It's the, I'm not the agent and say, hey, you need to sell your home. We can sell it for you no matter what. Right now, if you're in that group where you're at risk, don't sell your home. Don't buy your home if you don't need to, because it's just not worth going through the transaction, going through that. Even though the, the contact points are very minimal, it's just not worth your health risk on there. So you want to make sure we're gonna, safe. And we're going to get through it. Like when, when it's going to be over, it'll be over someday. Who knows? But, you know, safety first. Exactly. Um, anything else you want to talk about at all, David? Uh, well, you had mentioned, you know, some, uh, and I don't know if you want to wait for like a question thing, but like you had mentioned like possible delays that we could have. Yeah. I mean, we can all, we, we'll, we'll come back to that. Actually, we'll go over that okay. once we get towards the closing on there. So um, one thing I did want to go over is kind of the way transactions for both the buyer and the seller have changed since all these new rules have been implemented. So like I said, last Saturday, um, real estate in general, just basically got classified as essential again. So that doesn't mean everybody's going out doing open houses, but it means that if transactions need to be done, there's ways to get through them as long as you're doing it safely. So right now, 
if you're a if you're a buyer, let's start with buyers. So buyers right now, you're going to start seeing homes that are hitting the market are going to have a lot more virtual tours uh, because that's really the best way to see properties to keep yourself safe. So when agents are putting their homes on the market, most of them, if they're smart at least, are getting some virtual tours done, whether that's through Matterport, which kind of gives you that live way to walk through it and do 360 views of every room. So you have a really good idea of not only what the room looks like, but the general layout of the home, um, or just even a visual walkthrough as taking a video and walking through the property so you have a good, a better idea than versus just 20 pictures online. So that's one of the first things that you should start seeing happen during this whole thing. Um, so buyers, you can really get most of what you need done in terms of looking at a property done without being there. You can drive by the neighborhood if you want to. If you're not going into houses, you can see the neighborhood if you're not familiar with it, and then just use that virtual tour to really take a look at the property. Now, if you're someone that needs to see that house before you want to commit to anything, it's going to be harder to be able to get into escrow at this point, but there are ways around that. So right now, you can write the contract in terms of a purchase agreement saying that, hey, I love this house. I've done all the comparable sales. I know what this property is worth based on the pictures and everything you've provided. Here's my offer, but I want to have a physical, uh, I want to physically be able to look at it, let's say within the first 48 hours, um, if you accept my offer. So that way you can kind of hammer out all the terms with the seller before really even having to go there. And for the seller side of it, that kind of gives them a better idea of your financial situation because you're going to be sending them a pre-approval letter from a lender. You're going to be sending them proof of funds, all that kind of stuff up front. So in terms of the seller side, they're only allowing people in their homes that are actually able to purchase the property, have a lot of interest to purchase the property and have that intent to buy it. So that's one thing that's kind of changed. Whereas before you just kind of either scheduling showings with your agent, which you can still do if, as long as you're making that six foot rule, making sure you're staying, every, keeping everything disinfected, bring that hand sanitizer with you, bring a mask with you. If you have one, um, you can still see homes, but you really want to, Put that at a minimum right now right now safety is first so if you have to see it first and the agent's okay with it on both sides go for it the, the best time you can do this if it's a vacant home then there's a lot less risk involved because you're really just staying six feet away from someone open the door as an agent open the door for you you have checked the place out try not to touch anything and then you'll have a good idea of what the property looks like so that's kind of the way the beginning of the transaction has changed um, and that's one of the more significant changes uh, Another thing with the buyer, and this kind of goes back with the lender, and I talked about it a little bit already, is with buyers, you have to check in with your lender pretty much every single day while you're looking for properties to making sure that you're still qualified for the property. Because a lot of times, especially right now, things are changing so quickly that, like, like uh, Mina was saying before, is one day you might qualify for something, one day interest rates might bump up by a quarter percent and you no longer qualify for it because rates are fluctuating so much, programs are fluctuating so much. It's just something that you need to do. Whereas before you got that pre-approval, it was good for 60 days or so, and you're kind of just going out and looking for homes. You really just can't do that anymore. You need to be in better contact with your lender. Um, Mina, is that pretty accurate to say that basically trying to check in new as much as possible? Yeah, and I mean, um, from the lender's perspective, they should be checking in with you too, because yeah, of all hopefully, these yeah. <laughs> You know, but um, yeah, definitely we've never seen this many changes done. And, you know, it could be pretty big changes. Like for example, with government loans, they're being impacted a lot right now. FICO score requirements are getting higher because again, the risk factor and the whole, there's like a huge thing I could go into a secondary market, but I don't wanna bore you guys to death. But yeah, definitely um, as far as the buyer goes, make sure that you're aware that a lot of changes are being made out of anybody's control. but. Hopefully, yeah, like I think now more than ever with any professionals you're working with, make sure they're updating you because there's a lot of news that we're going to get that's not out to the public. Because even with the interest rates, I mean, at one point when the federal fund rate dropped to zero percent, friendly reminder about that, too. It doesn't mean the mortgage rates are at zero percent. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, if I could give you zero percent, I definitely would. But I mean, um, <laughs> the federal fund rate are the short term rates. Mortgage rates don't follow that. They follow a much, much bigger picture. And now right now. We're seeing the secondary mortgage market being the big driver of the rates. But with the rates too, I mean, the news would be advertising or um, kind of circulating an article that happened a day or a week ago when it's not true at all anymore. And so I think from the mortgage perspective, hopefully it's just more people need to be constantly 
extra communicative um, in times like this. So people are well prepared and we're setting the right expectations. Perfect, yep. Um, okay, and so a couple of things that have changed in terms of the buying side. Um, right now you can expect, actually this is both buying and selling side, that anytime before you see a property now, most likely you're going to have to sign some type of advisory agreement. It's basically saying, yes, I know the risks of COVID-19. I know how to keep myself safe. I know how to keep the seller safe. And that's something that most brokerages are coming up with. Um, and so they might vary a little bit brokerage by brokerage, but that's something that if you're a buyer, you're gonna need to kind of expect that before you can see homes, you're gonna be sent this document. You can do it electronically, so you're not face to face with anybody, but sent this document basically saying that, yes, I know what I'm supposed to do as a responsible citizen to keep the seller safe. And that's just something that, that you're gonna start seeing pretty much on every transaction now. Um, Another thing with, um, David, I'm not sure if you've seen this at all, but with like uh, preliminary title reports, are you seeing sellers do that ahead of time to, to give to buyers at all? Is there any advantage to have the seller get that as they sign the contract before they put it on the market so they can, one, make sure there's no problems with it so you can figure it out faster, but two, does that give the buyer any advantage of having that in front of them before they look at the property? I think it actually gives everybody an advantage. Okay. Um, so the preliminary title report is is the first step in issuing title insurance. It basically shows all liens, encumbrances, um, things like that. You know, uh, it shows everything about the chain of title on the real property, and and it's a requirement of the transaction. And we always believe, even before COVID nineteen, after COVID nineteen. Uh, you're working with Josh. As soon as you sign the listing, Josh should order the preliminary title report. Um, now more than ever, you know, just like everybody else in the industry, we, we don't get paid until the transaction closes. Uh, and it's a service that we offer. So there's a couple of reasons why we want to order the listing prelim uh, immediately. First and foremost, um, you know, full disclosure, you know, it, it's taking a little bit longer to get prelims right now. We have an influx of mortgages. There's a tremendous amount of, of deals happening um, and, and, you know, just like anything, you, you know, you go to in and out and there's a super long line at 6 p.m. on a Friday, like it's just going to take you longer to get your double double. So the same is true with title. And so we want to make sure that we get that preliminary title report as quickly as possible. Uh, number one and number two, the reason why we want to do that is, is there could be things on the preliminary title report that due to COVID-19 is going to take longer uh, for us to clear up. Remember, I said at the end of the transaction, we need to make sure that we can issue clear title. Like we're the ones that says you can close or not, basically. And there are certain things that can take time to get cleared up. And even before you get an offer on your house, we can start working on getting the documentation necessary to clear those what we call exceptions in the prelim, Josh. And, and so that's really important. And there's one um, there's one right now that I think is, is hands down the most important uh, to understand uh, because, you know, yes, we can still e-record and we are still closing transactions as of 139. But um, most, you know, all county recorders have closed their doors to walk-ins um, at this point. I, I don't know if there's even a single one there, but some, sometimes, you know, if, if you're selling the property and, uh, somebody, the property's owned in a trust and one of those people passed away. Um, a, 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 it sounds more of a, a lot of it has to do with, with people that have passed. You're selling the property, your husband, your wife, your spouse, brothers, I mean, whatever it might be has passed. One of the other original documents that we need is a, an original death certificate. And you used to be able to just walk into the county, get, you know, fill out a form, get an original death certificate. You're done in five minutes. You can't do that anymore. You have to order the death certificates online and and that of course creates a lag time so if we're able to figure out the what could be the pitfalls or, or things that could delay that because we have the prelim early uh it, it's it's a it's just the best way to do it got it perfect yeah i mean that's something have you seen any of those issues that, that you've gone through yet in terms of like death certificates or anything like that come up i, I haven't it, okay I, I, I haven't yet, but I, you know, I'm, it, it's, it's a matter of, I mean, yeah. you know, it's a, I feel that it's a matter of time. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're doing, we're doing our best to get the word out. You know, 
I mean, Josh, you, you and I work together for a long time now. You know, you know to order listing prelims. Yeah. Um, and so if we're doing that on the front end, we're not going to have an issue. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so that, a couple more points for the, on the buyer side of things. So once you do get into escrow, two things that you usually are in person for is the inspection. A lot of times you'll have an inspection done on a home. You'll go there either during the inspection or towards the end of it. The inspector will go over the report with you, tell you what's wrong with the home, that type of thing. Most inspectors are not doing that even more, anymore. So even with the six foot rule and that type of thing, most inspectors are going to require that the property is vacated while they're doing the inspection. Uh, they're taking the proper precautions, putting on gloves, they're putting on booties for their feet, they're putting on masks if they have them. Uh, but what they're doing is they're going through, doing the inspection, coming back, writing the report up, and then instead of doing an in-person overview, they're basically going to give you a call and kind of explain everything that's wrong with the property. So again, right now, we're just trying to eliminate as many face-to-face -face contacts as possible. And that's not really going to have any kind of detrimental effect to your transaction versus being there versus not, uh, because you're gonna be still getting the same information. You're gonna be getting pictures from the inspector of what's going on in the property. So really they're going over the same stuff. It's just gonna be virtual versus in-person, which is kind of the theme for everything in real estate right now. So that's one of the other things. Um, and for appraisals, that's another one. That's more on the selling side, but uh, Mina kind of touched on it already. A lot of companies are now allowing for drive-by or off-site appraisals, they're called. So basically doing the appraisal without having someone going into the property physically to do the appraisal. Um, so that's also helping the eliminate that face-to-face -face contact and any possibility of spreading any kind of virus on there. So um, Mina, have you seen um, a significant amount of people moving towards that, like offsite appraisals, or is that just starting to happen? It's kind of starting to happen. They officially implemented it, I think, around the end of last week. And so that's when all the okay. companies started actually updating everything to make sure that we can, you know, account for those kind of options. But yeah, I think um, with the appraisal, fortunately, you know, we're seeing Fannie and Freddie, who are the main uh, regulatory agencies for conventional loans. So all the mortgage companies, no matter where you go, are going to follow their guidelines. But I'm happy to see that they're actually adjusting to the current climate we're in now. And I guess I'm on the topic of making sure that we're prepared for any delays. I also wanted to note that verbal verification of employment. So when you are buying a home and you're in escrow, what the lender would have to do about 10 days prior to the close date, we would have to verbally confirm the employment. But then right now we need to do a 24 hour verbal verification of employment too. And not from me, but our funder or whatever the mortgage company's funders are. And the reason why that's kind of important at this point in time is because nobody is in the office to take the call. And so what I'm recommending to any clients opening escrow is one, just let them know that this is going to be happening on the day of closing. And so especially for a purchase where you're on the day of, you know, close of escrow, everyone's waiting on it, but you can't get a hold of anyone to confirm you still work there. You know, it could be like a scrambling anxiety filled moment, which we don't need in our lives right okay. now. So prepare to have maybe a contact or even an email address of your manager or boss that the funders can reach out to to confirm the verbal verification. And that could save a lot of stress and scrambling around between all parties involved. Yeah. Okay. And is that pretty standard for a 24-hour notice now type of thing? So basically the day before escrow closes or is it a like a window, like 24 to 48 hours or something like that? Basically 24 hours before the close okay. of escrow right now. And I think everyone's getting so much tighter on that because like I mentioned and what we talked about, um, it's just about the uncertainty, making sure that, you know, they're going to be able to afford the mortgage payments because at the end of the day, it's not even about closing. It's about making sure that you're going to be comfortable with the payment. So they need to make sure and confirm all the way up to the last minute that, you know, you're still going to be getting your income. Got it. Okay, perfect. Um, so, I mean, that for buyers, that's really going to be about it in terms of the, what has changed. So, I mean, there has been some changes, but in general, for the most part, I mean, the real estate transaction, most of the documents you're signing are all electronic now anyway. So, you're not really doing anything face-to-face -face except for deeds um, and usually that last packet of the lender documents at the very end. Um, those are really the only two signings that you usually have to have notarized on any form on there. So, everything else is electronic. Um, with viewing the property, really the most you'll have to go out of the house to view the property would be twice. If you want to have that visual inspection of it, either right before or right after you go into escrow, you can. And then the only other time you're really in the property would be a few days before escrow closes. 
Um, and that's just basically to determine, make sure there's no giant holes in the wall or broken windows and the property is in similar condition. Um, it's called the verification of property. It's a form that's basically filled out two to three days usually before escrow closes. So those are the only two times you're going out of the house. Uh, with notary services, a lot of times they can come to you, so you don't have to go out. But if you do, you need to go to your bank, which are still open. So that's, again, not usually too big of an issue getting a notary either out to you, because like Mina was saying, usually lenders will have or escrow will have a couple backup notaries if one of them's out or one of them can't do it. So in terms of contact points, I mean, there's not very many contact points during a transaction for a buyer that you really have to worry about in terms of being too close to someone on there. So that's something I like to stress a lot because buyers right now with interest rates, even though they are fluctuating, they are still historically low. So most of the time, I think they went a little bit above 4% if I remember correctly, I think it was last yeah. week for a while. Um, but I think at least as of today there or yesterday, they were still below, they're still below 4% for the most part, at least average wise. Is that yeah, and then correct? I think um, it's important to remember too, for any new buyers looking to get into the market, the rates and the average rates you're seeing online and those kind of things, keep in mind, it depends on your specific situation. So what is your credit score compared to the average, I guess, rate uh, in which they're, you know, calculating the credit score, you know? And so whatever, I guess, your scenario is, what the down payment is, what kind of property you're buying, what the FICO scores are, all these different details do come into what your rate is. And so it's a good guideline to look at the average rate to see how it's fluctuating. But yeah, definitely talk to somebody to see how exactly, you know, and why, you know, certain rates might be higher or lower depending on the programs and which one would be recommended. Okay, perfect. Uh, so that's really all in terms of the buyer, the transaction side of it. For safety wise, I kind of went over a little bit, but make sure if you are viewing properties, you have the hand sanitizer, gloves if possible, masks if possible. Um, and then just make sure you're not touching anything inside anybody's house. That's not only for your safety, but also for the seller's safety. If you're just opening the doorknob and looking at the property, you're not touching anything and you have all the protective gear, it's going to make it a much safer experience for everybody involved. And again, ideally, the best type of transactions happening right now are the ones that the seller has already vacated the property because that puts the risk for everybody a lot lower on there. Um, so that's really the, the biggest things on there to make sure that that you're staying safe. And then also for buyers, making sure you're really only going into properties, either that you put an offer on and put in the offer that you wanna have a visual inspection of it, or that you're very, very serious about purchasing it. You don't wanna just be going through properties just because this one might work, this might work. You really wanna have that criteria of your must haves in a house really narrowed down. So you're only viewing properties that you absolutely have to. Um, so for the seller side, that one does involve more contact points. So that's that's something I'm telling any seller that's looking at putting their home on the market right now, because a lot of times you're going to, even with all the technology, you're still going to have to have a few people in the house. So when you first start a transaction before you get it on escrow, you're going to need to have a photographer there. So that's something that a lot of photographers, they're still working. Everybody's taking precautions. They're doing the same type of sanitizing, making sure they're not touching anything while they're in there. Um, but it's up to the seller that make sure that all the lights are on beforehand, make sure that everything is basically ready. So the photographer can just go in there, take the pictures, leave, not turn lights on, not turn lights off, not touch anything. And that will keep it as safe as possible for both the photographer and the seller. Um, so that's one thing to look at. And then open houses right now, again, are gone for sellers. So that's not something that you need to expect to do or you can expect to do. Right now, it's pretty much only private showings, F that. Um, ideally, what I'm recommending for sellers right now is to do virtual showings only. So basically having someone go in, what I've seen is having the agent that you're working with go into the property and do a virtual showing with the other person through something like Zoom. So that way, if the uh, the buyer has questions, the agent's right there live on the phone with them to go look through the property and be able to answer questions while at the property. And another one that's just starting to happen because the MLSs are now updating to allow this to happen is virtual, virtual open houses. So that's something completely new that really hasn't been implemented before. But what that is, is basically the selling agent will go in at a certain time, let's say Saturday at one o'clock, and they'll be able to post that on places like Zillow and Redfin. And anybody interested in seeing the property or has questions about the property can log in again through something like Zoom or Skype, whatever the agent's using, 
and get a visual walkthrough of the property, ask questions, can I have a better look at this? Can you open this door? That type of thing. And for a seller, that's important because that way you only have your agent in the property and you don't have all these buyers coming through. And if buyers have questions about the property before they want to put in an offer, you can walk them through the property, answer the questions and point out things they might have had a question before uh, they decided to place an offer. So again, eliminates the amount of buyers coming into your house um, and just keeps you as safe as possible. And then again, I, I'll just reiterate this one more time is that with the... Uh, with everything going on, brokers are going to ask you to be filling out that that agreement, basically saying that you know the risks and the seller knows the risks. So something you're gonna have to be reviewing every time and you'll most likely have to sign it and send it over to every buyer letting into the house. So again, for your own hassle and for your own safety, it's better just to have your agent go through the house and be the only one in there if possible. Um, and homes are still selling that way. So we're still seeing homes the days on market has gone up, but it's still technically a seller's market right now. So if you put your home on the market, there's a good chance that you'll be able to get it sold and the prices aren't going down right now. They're basically flatline. They're not appreciating, but they're not going down. So if you need to sell your home, then you can still put it on the market. And as long as it's marketed properly with these new virtual type of showings and things like that, you're going to have a really good chance of selling your home. Um, and then same thing with the inspections. Uh, you're going to have to let an inspector in the house most likely unless it's a cash offer for some kind of investment property. Most people are going to want to have an inspection done on the property. And that's something that you're that you will need to allow the inspector in there. Again, most inspectors aren't going into homes unless they're taking precautions for themselves and the sellers. But that is another contact point where someone's going to be in your home. So it's something to be aware of. And then, like we talked about before, making sure that you're getting that that title. Uh, prelim title done beforehand so that way if something comes up you know there's an issue right away get it taken care of that way it's not going to delay closing because right now it's hard enough for the lenders on their side to kind of make sure the the escrow is going fine and they can get the loan closed in 30 days because what right now within escrow things are changing so rapidly yes go ahead david <laughs> Yeah, I just I wanted to add real quick with with the title, you know, if you're unsure how your property is held, like mm -hmm. is it in a trust? You know, did we change this? Who owns this thing? Just just reach out to Josh. That's not something we need a prelim for. We can turn that around for you like that. It's a free service. Um, we're more than happy to help you with that. Perfect. Yep. So other than that, in terms of seller, I mean that's that's what you're looking for. So yes, you can pretty much eliminate. 90% of buyers in the house because of the virtual showings, there are going to be buyers that won't place offers on your home if you don't allow them to physically be there. But maybe you're not going to be looking at that buyer then. You're looking at buyers that are willing to go do the virtual showing and then maybe once an escrow, check it out just to verify everything matches up from what they saw in the pictures or video walkthroughs. Um, and that's something that you'll have to kind of live with if you're putting your home on the market right now is that you'll have still a good chunk of buyers in the market looking because interest rates are still really low right now, even though they're fluctuating. And so if you can take advantage of that right now, you'll still able to sell your home and you're still able to sell it at market value right now, which is important because a lot of people think that all of a sudden in the next like week, everything is going to tank 10% in the housing market. That's just really not the case. The numbers aren't showing that the, the statistics aren't showing that. So that is not going to happen over the next week or two in the housing market. Now, if this thing went on until like next year, then you can start saying, okay, maybe we're going to have some, uh, some negative or some depreciation on the homes on there. But right now, all the models are showing that we're probably going to be spiking in April. And at some time, maybe towards the end of June, um, things will hopefully start going back to normal. If that's the case, and that's how everything kind of gets uh, played out, then this is really just a temporary thing. You're going to have a very low or a very uh, big dip right now in terms of demand and supply. But when this is over, people still need to sell their houses. Interest rates are going to be extremely low still because of everything going on. So there's going to be a housing market that's going to come back roaring once everything is said and done. Mina, you, know, you had something. Yeah, and actually you already touched upon it right there. But yeah, it's just okay. more of a reminder to everybody that, you know, when you buy a home and you enter the market, it's a long run game. And so like no doubt with everything going on and literally people staying at home right now, it's going to impact the housing market. And, you know, there's no doubt about that. But then in the short term, 
maybe we might see some uncertainties and everything is a little bit iffy, but in the long term, if we really look at and focus on the data and stats, because, you know, during pessimistic times, I think it's kind of interesting how if you focus on the stats and data and actual facts, you can make your decisions a lot more in a logical sense rather than, you know, being kind of, I guess, complacent with fear. Because I think that's one of the biggest things that I think people should avoid to find the right silver linings in the market right now. But I mean, I think as far as buyers go, in the home prices right now, or I guess offering on a home, before everything started happening and escalating, we were in a really strong real estate market. But then for those buyers who are looking around putting offers on homes, I'm sure they can attest to this as well, but it was very competitive, like 10, 15 offers on one single home. It was a, you know, it was a really difficult situation and very competitive. But then right now in for the right buyer, for the right seller, it might present a pretty good opportunity that wasn't there just a few weeks ago. And yes, we don't know how long this might last and the, how the depreciation might be impacted in the short run. But in the long run, because we know that the demand was so high just before this, the rates are going to remain low for the next year and a half or two, then in that case, there's going to be a lot of demand coming in. And at the end of the day, the home values are impacted by supply and demand. There's not very much supply, but there's going to be a lot of demand once we're kind of out and about and finally able to leave our home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, that that's something that everybody needs to keep in mind and kind of mean it, mean it hit it on the head right there. So right now, right before this happened, the market was probably the strongest it's been in a, in a few years going into the spring market because the interest rates and demand was extremely high. So every home that I was putting on the market, multiple offers getting on the homes. It's just, that's how it was. And this is a temporary thing. It's not like something that's going to last a couple of years at a time. So you need to be looking at your, your financials and saying, if I can afford this home and I'm going to be here for five, plus years, interest rates are great right now. There's a little bit less competition for a buyer right now in the market because people are staying home as they should. But if you're willing to do the virtual tours, you're willing to go through the extra couple steps and loops that you have to go through uh, when you're doing a transaction now more virtually, then there's some good deals out there for buyers right now because you have, you have less of competition. You're not having the 10 offers on every home where it's driving it up $20,000 over the market value price but you're still able to get the home at market value, which is a great thing for both buyers and sellers, to be honest, because they're not losing money on their home if they need to sell it right now. It's just might take a little bit longer to sell it than normal. And they might make, not get 10 offers. They might get one or two offers instead. Yeah. Um, so I'll try to wrap things up a little bit, but a couple more things on the buyer. Um, right now, if you are, or sorry, a seller, right now, if you are a seller, one thing that you need to make sure your agent is doing is before you accept any offers, you need to contact the buyer's lender the day you ex before you accept the offer. Because like we talked about on the buyer's side, things change so rapidly that if they give you a pre-approval that was a week old, they can no longer qualify for that loan based on everything going on right now. So you need to make sure um, as a seller that your agent is reaching out to the lender the day you're basically about to accept that offer to make sure they're financially strong enough and nothing has changed significantly. Yeah, and then um, to add on that too, and again, timestamp 1.59 PM on April 1st, but the few programs I would really keep an eye out on right now is going to be jumbo loans, um, non-QM, which means any loan programs that aren't as much documentation. So bank statement programs, like one year, 1099, all these different kind of like niche programs and also government loans, so FHA, VA. Make sure, especially if the pre-approval is with one of those programs, to follow up with that lender or the lender of the buyer, of course, um, about that pre-approval because those are the programs that we're seeing a lot of changes on constantly on a daily basis currently. We don't know about tomorrow or later today, but currently. <laughs> Just yeah. a quick tip there. Got it. Perfect. And then last thing um, with sellers is that there's something that usually what happens is when they, a buyer places an offer, they'll usually provide the proof of funds that shows they have enough money in the cash to be able to either make the down payment or if it's all cash offer, the whole thing. And there's a pre-approval letter. So those are things you can usually, you're usually expected to wait for the offer to come in before you see those. But now I'm starting to see that buyers are willing to send it over beforehand. It's basically proof that they can afford the property, that they're interested in the property. And that way it's giving sellers a little bit more indication. This is a serious buyer. They've got the pre-qualification. I see their proof of funds. They have it. So again, making sure sellers are only letting people in their homes 
they're absolutely able to purchase a house and have a high intent on there. Um, so that's basically it for seller. In terms of safety for sellers, one of the biggest things is to make sure that if you are allowing anybody in your home and not doing virtual only tours, that you need to make sure you have like a hand, san hand sanitizing station set up at the front door with something saying, hey, please use this um, before you enter the property to make sure all buyers are using it. Um, if you have those shoe booties to have them using as well, any type of way to get to keep the germs from getting into the house, that's what you're going to want to do. And then after buyers look at it, even though you told them not to touch anything, you want to make sure you're sanitizing your house as well. So ideally, if you have to let a buyer into the house, make sure you have hand sanitizer, make sure all the lights are on, all the doors are open. So you eliminate the buyer's need to touch anything. And that's the best practice that we can really give you to make sure that you're going to be as safe as possible during this. Um, and then other than that, I mean, that, that's pretty much it in terms of safety wise and sellers. Like I said, if you're find a buyer that's able to do the virtual tour and is comfortable with it, you might have to have a buyer in your house twice during the escrow process. You'll have to have an inspector in your house and you'll have to have a photographer in your house. So you'll have to have four people in your house. If you're comfortable with that and they're taking precautions and you're taking precautions, then you have a good chance of selling your house right now. Buyers, really the biggest thing I wanna say right now is if you're able to stay protected and you're staying safe, right now is a good time to continue looking because interest rates and because you're not really having as much competition as you should this time of year. So usually you're like, a, like we've been talking about, you're having multiple offers on every home. Right now, if you're finding the perfect place, you can get it for market value. You don't have to have that price driven up above market value. So you can get a great deal on a home right now if you're patient, you're only looking at homes that you're really interested in. Uh, you might not be seeing them hit the market every day, but maybe once or twice a week, you're seeing those homes that you could really see yourself living in. So if you are able to, and you can stay safe, it's a really good time, especially now if you're probably, to be honest, now through June is probably going to be a great time for buyers to look at properties until we start getting back into that hot seller's market when things start calming down and the inventory starts going up and then all the buyer, the rest of the buyers start coming back into the market. So Mina, I'm not sure if you have anything to wrap it up or anything else you want to say about it. Uh, no, I think I am good for now, but I guess okay. I'll, one thing I will mention, I know uh, Warren Buffett and things like that, um, I love reading about, but yeah, they always say be a buyer on the most pessimistic day. And so I think as long as, you know, like Josh mentioned, safety precautions first, but also just keep an eye on, you know, Zillow, or Redfin, just keep an eye on it at the very least, because if the opportunity presents itself, then at least, you know, you're prepared in a way where at least you have the foundational knowledge of what's going on. Got it. And then David, anything on your end that you, do you want to say to wrap it up on title at all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, you know, if, if you don't know how your property's held, you know, reach out to Josh, we'll get you taken care of, but Josh, thanks for having me on, man. This is really, uh, this is really super important information and, and you, you and me both, both did a great job explaining what's going on. So if you want to do, you know, weekly bi-weekly updates of this let's by all means yeah. let's do it this is really yeah. valuable stuff yep i agree perfect now okay, we can talk well, more thanks. arby's and uh jack in the box too and tiger <laughs> king we didn't even talk about uh, tiger king i just finished that actually okay. i'm getting my mullet for next week then we'll be good to go <laughs> awesome okay well thank you for stopping by and thank you for anybody that's tuning in and hopefully we'll see you again pretty soon with a new update yeah thank you everyone see you later bye